Um, so I think we can begin. Uh, we have a full program today and, and it's going to run through 4.30. Uh, first of all, before we start, I would really like to um, thank our amazing, amazing partners um, in the uh, climate tech ecosystem, the Israeli Innovation Authority and Planetech, who have been really relentless in, in doing uh, all of this uh, capacity building work just throughout uh, the course of the past few years and, and certainly uh, during the, these uh, difficult times. And um, um, we are very grateful for their partnership in this uh, webinar as well. And uh, of course, to our speakers, our guest speakers, Michael and Danny, who will uh, uh, be speaking and uh, presenting uh, later on in the program for, for their time and attention and, and for their friendship to the Israeli climate tech community, of course. Um, I, I should say that, uh, of course, as everyone is aware, this is uh, an extremely complex and difficult time for Israel uh, right now. And, and we would like to just really send our endless love and, and support to everyone who has been directly affected um, by, by the events of October 7th and, and the aftermath of those events. And, and we send our uh, deepest condolences to, to everyone who has lost uh, um, family members and friends and, and uh, close relatives. And, and there are many of those, unfortunately. And we um, pray for the safe return of everyone who is behind enemy lines. This is unfortunately the reality that we live in uh, today. However, we are relentless, as uh, you know, and, and we are committed to growth. And that is why we are here today. And uh, what we'll be doing uh, over the course of the next hour and a half is looking forward and looking at practical tools for growth within the climate tech community and primarily uh, at carbon markets as a um, significant leverage for uh, investment in innovative climate tech technologies. That are, is a very specific goal, but that is why uh, we are uh, here today. And that is what we will try to achieve. Uh, so I would like to uh, dive uh, directly into the program. I'll just say that um, what we're going to be doing today is we'll have uh, two uh, speakers from our partners uh, at the start of the program, um, uh, Noam and Hagit, who will be uh, presenting shortly. And then I will speak and uh, Michael and Danny. And afterwards, we'll have uh, an informal uh, Q&A session. Uh, you're all welcome to um, uh, post your uh, questions in the Q&A box and we'll collect them and, and try to respond as time permits at the end of the uh, speaking sessions. Noam, please go ahead. Thank you, Ruth. Um... Can uh, Gal, can you please let me share my screen? I'll start by joining Ruth to uh, her greetings for the family members and the and the ones uh, who lost and the and the uh, wounded ones and the, for uh, actually the approach of uh, supporting the growth of Israel while uh, while this, we we are going through these difficult times. Uh, I think I can share my screen now. I'll just can, can you see my screen? I guess I, I will I will assume that you that you can. First, thank you, Ruth, for this partnership and all of the team in at Herzog and the Chagit and the team in the uh, Israel Innovation Authority for being partners in these times and uh, being time uh, partners always. Um, I'm the director of uh, Planetech. Uh, we are a uh, non-profit joint venture 
of the Israel Innovation Institute. It's an institute for innovation communities, consensus business group, which is an investment house. We invest a lot in the Israeli startups and the Israeli Ministry of Environmental Protection. In Planet includes uh, the Israeli and global climate tech ecosystem in tackling a climate change via a combination of approaches. Basically, this is done by shifting the business focus and, uh, and uh, creating a global network for climate innovators uh, while promoting Israel as a, a world center for climate change technologies. We do that by different activities. Our main idea is to centralize the ecosystem and the different stakeholders in the ecosystem. In order to do that, we work with the startups, the academia, NGOs, corporates, investors, and government. And in a different reality, we're actually we're supposed to be after uh, the Climate Tech uh, Week, actually the first Climate Tech Week in Israel, uh, a week full of 15 side events and focusing just on climate tech and uh, our main event, uh, climate, uh, Planet Tech World, 3,000 visitors, 70 speakers, uh, 130 startups exhibiting their climate technology. I counted on the eve of October 6th uh, delegations from about 35 countries and, and investors from different uh, from different uh, countries, 35, around 35, from Seoul to Abu Dhabi, Nairobi, all over Europe, North America, to Santiago and Buenos Aires. Uh, we hope to have this, uh, this climate uh, tech week. Uh, if, the, if the situation will allow it, we'll have it on Q1. Uh, 2024 was supposed to be a summit um, and showcase of the ecosystem in Israel. And they have, we, as, as you can hear, uh, it gathered quite a lot of attention from the rest of the world. Um, till then, and as uh, Ruth mentioned, we do quite a lot of activities to support the ecosystem and the current situation, mainly around the capacity building. So this is the first webinar as part of, yeah, as part of a, a few other webinars. The next one will focus on investment and financing in these times and climate tech acceleration programs of opportunities. We we'll like the, to expose to the ecosystem some knowledge uh, and support growth. Again, it's uh, at these times. And uh, we are going to launch the project that we are work on for quite some time now, J job in the talent world, focusing just on climate tech. Uh, it will, we heard from members of the community that it, this is something that they much needed at the moment. Uh, we are launching a project of office hours, uh, investors and uh, other uh, professionals will um, devote their times for the ecosystem. Uh, to share their knowledge, to uh, and uh, to to have a personal one-on-one -on -one -on -one meetings or one to two few meetings, and uh, we're going to launch the uh, uh, our Planet X uh, startup platform uh, 2.0, basically a new platform with more uh, options and uh, and better um, functionalities. So please follow up on LinkedIn. You can approach us uh, to our personal accounts. Uh, personally, most of the time I'm in on reserves, but uh, I, I promise to, to answer all of you. And uh, my amazing team is here and works super hard to support the ecosystem uh, these times. Thanks again for all of you for joining this, um, this webinar. Hagit, I guess the stage is yours. Okay, I'm here. Hi, Hagit. Uh, hi. Um, 
Yes, I can start. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Ruti, for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of the Innovation Authority on this occasion. Um, I must say, I wasn't sure what I should say on this occasion, and it's it's not so easy for everybody, I guess. Um, until a month ago, things were very clear in the authority. We had uh, a focus, a clear focus on climate tech, including mitigation technologies, the adaptation we need to achieve. Most of my time I put in this. Um, discussions were about how to do this, how to encourage the ecosystem and which tools to use to identify um, and fill in gaps or remove barriers. Um, after October the 7th, after the war started, all of these, um, all of those looked irrelevant. Um, all the plans were canceled naturally, including, as Norm said, um, Climate Week, um, the preparations and everything, and other programs we had. And for me, it looked like thinking about climate crisis or changes is a privilege we don't really have at the moment. Um, so in the authority, we started to think about the current situation and how we can help in the immediate needs to everyone, all startups and companies in all areas. Um, the fast track for funding was activated um, to help in, bring it, in bridging the financing gap of technologically innovated, innovative companies uh, resulted from the war. Target companies are the one in need of a funding bridge so that in the future they will be able to continue their growth and live up to their business potential. Um, and if someone is interested in more details, um, it is in our website and contact details also. And uh, you can approach me also at the end of this webinar. So we also published a call for proposal to support platforms that connect between um, companies with specific temporal needs. Here it is. Uh, thank you. With temporal needs of, of human capital and trained workers with different expertise or experience that can help immediately. So this is another thing we have or we will have um, soon, very soon. Um, and any other idea someone here has that we can help in the very short term, please let us know. We're very much interested to hear about the difficulties and challenges and to think together how we can help in the very short term. But there's no doubt that we also must go back to think about climate. Um, maybe now is the time to think about future catastrophes to get prepared and to avoid what we can, to mitigate and to adapt to changes and to increase social resilience to future disasters that will be related maybe to climate change. And so slowly but surely we go back to the climate, identifying specific areas that needs more attention or specific attention, either because of the specific potential or challenges identifying barriers and thinking about tools that we can recruit or establish in order to facilitate and promote innovative technologies, to bring technological solutions to climate challenges while strengthening the economy, that we really need that. So we think how to use all the tools we have in the authority to help entrepreneurs to establish new startups, support the growth of existing ones and to implement innovative technologies any thought or idea also here will be very much appreciated. Um, and that's it. Thank you again, Ruti, for organizing this event. Thank you also, Noam and Planet Tech, for the collaboration that put us all back on track. We're with you in the next Climate Week. Um, we, appreciate, we appreciate it very much. Um, thank you again for the invitation and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Habit. Thanks very much. And, and again, thanks uh, for the partnership. We definitely look forward to 
uh, Q1 of uh, 2024 for all of the possible reasons that everyone can imagine. Um, okay, so um, I would like to go ahead and uh, dive into uh, the first presentation, which is mine. Uh, I'll just say a few words about what we do um, in this ecosystem here at Herzog. Um, so I'm a partner here at Herzog and I uh, head the environment and uh, climate change uh, practice. Um, the work that we do in the climate change space uh, concentrates on uh, two main areas. One is work relating to international um, regulation in this space, uh, primarily in the UA and uh, the United States. And uh, there's an incredible thunderstorm going on right now. And uh, I, I hope that you guys can hear me okay. But um, it, it's quite noisy and uh, very appropriate for the topic we're discussing. And um, so, so uh, I'll go back to describing uh, our practice. We have the work that we're doing on uh, international climate related and sustainability related regulation. And we have uh, work that is related specifically to carbon markets. And uh, of course, uh, both of those really uh, in interact quite closely. Danny, can you put your cell phone mute, please? Um, and I, I think that will really uh, come into play right now when I uh, speak uh, more in depth in, um, uh, in relation to carbon markets. And, and what I'll try to do is really illustrate this from the practical day-to-day -day work that we do with our uh, clients on a daily basis. So uh, to those of you who know me, um, you, you've probably noticed that I uh, make a point of starting my talks with uh, a vivid, timely illustration of why we are gathered here today in this forum. And, and we mustn't lose sight of the goal that we are uh, attempting to attain collectively. Uh, and that is to uh, somehow mitigate uh, climate change to, to the greatest extent possible under the circumstances. And I came across this visual that really uh, hit me very strongly. Um, it, it's very vivid in my view, and it basically shows the number of days between billion dollar climatic disasters in the US alone. And we are now down to 18 days in total, that's all. 18 days between billion dollar climatic disasters. And clearly we can all understand what this costs, both in uh, uh, physical damage, sometimes irreparable, and, and both of course, in, just uh, in, in terms of the financial investment required to come out of such disasters. Um, now, ultimately, the, the climate issue is why we're seeing this incredible influx of regulation all around the world and, and primarily coming out of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the actual topic of my talk, so I'm not going to delve into that too much, but uh, it is important because it's a critical element to understand the mindset of the uh, organizations that are going to be looking at investing in uh, climate technologies and are going to be buying credits generated from climate technologies. So um, in essence, if I have to pick one item from, from this uh, vast array of, of uh, uh, regulatory and policy developments, I would of course speak about the taxonomy because it most vividly uh, illustrates what we're up against here and, and what our ultimate goal is. And the taxonomy, I think that many of you have heard me speak about it uh, quite frequently. It is also a very practical tool that we use um, uh, for working with our clients on, on um, I guess, designing their uh, strategy for carbon markets. But um, essentially what the taxonomy is, is a, a crystal ball of sorts. It shows us what the economy uh, is going to look like when we're 
through the transition period and over the transition period. And, and that's what we're striving to attend. We are striving to look like what the taxonomy looks like. Uh, that is our ultimate goal. And how are we going to get there? We have uh, uh, the financial sector who has uh, effectively been forcefully drafted into this uh, operation and, and they're all under very, very strict uh, regulation that requires them to both report and gradually uh, actually shift their portfolio for financing uh, in the direction of what the taxonomy looks like. And this is in order to uh, um, basically uh, funnel uh, the, the investments in the right directions at the level of real corporations. Now, just so uh, we, we understand what we're up against and the magnitude of the challenge, and, and this is also where the opportunity lies. That's why it is so important to realize the uh, interest set that is in play here. The taxonomy is such that uh, over 60% of global companies have some exposure to it uh, with only 11% potentially aligned. That is of uh, the 2020s. This is uh, uh, quite uh, up-to-date uh, uh, data. So we're in a situation where the gap is quite large. There is no question about that. And in order to close it, we need to uh, move into a world of very, very specific technologies. Some of them are really in infancy right now. Some of them don't even exist. And in order to do that, we need the funds. So there lies the opportunity. And essentially for the financial sector, this is indeed uh, uh, something that they are compelled to do under the regulation um, that applies to them, but it is also an incredible opportunity for them at the same time. There is so much activity to be funded. It's like basically a candy store for them just to pick and choose. Um, and, and if we look at where the specific interests lie within the carbon markets today, we need to look at the projections for the future. And uh, first of all, you need to be aware that this is indeed a risky business for buyers and for uh, investors. There is no question about that. And I just saw uh, actually this morning a visual that uh, illustrates the, the um, huge divergence between projections of, of how this market is going to look in terms of uh, its size over the course of the transition period. However, um, there is agreement that is there is going to be a very significant price hack, uh, hike um, that is also connected intrinsically, of course, to increasing demand uh, uh, for carbon credits. However, it should be kept in mind that this demand is, is no longer uh, one dimensional. It is a very sophisticated demand because uh, it relates very strongly to the quality and the integrity of the credits and the specific portfolio. So we are re really looking at the intricacies of those credits at this point. And, and the market is becoming much, much more sophisticated in that sense. Now, um, we are seeing many buyers, uh, um, the big names uh, are the big players within this arena today. And I think the major takeaway that I would want you to have from uh, this specific slide is the fact that um, essentially I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, findings from a very recent uh, uh, research that was published regarding the uh, state of mind of uh, buyers of offsets and, and players within the uh, voluntary carbon market. And yeah. I was very happy to see those findings because essentially they validated what I have known for years. And that is the fact that there is a very strong correlation between corporations that are active within the voluntary market and corporations that do actual decarbonization work, deep decarbonization work in-house, okay? So, so those are very uh, strongly connected to one another and there's actually no surprise about that. Now, if you think about it, that there's a lot of insight here 
regarding um, what that would mean in terms of who our target audience is, uh, who, who the uh, climate tech companies would be speaking to when they are um, uh, presenting their technologies. This state of mind is incredibly important and, and this uh, uh, connection between in-house decarbonization work and the, the activity within the VCM is, is very, very important in the business sense. The second point that is incredibly important is the data that you see uh, before you right now in this slide, which essentially means that the market is shifting towards um, uh, purchase of future credits. And, and I will talk in a minute about the contractual structures for that. But uh, uh, this is a very uh, strong and, and uh, vivid uh, trend that we are seeing in the market. And that is also our experience uh, with respect to uh, companies that we work with. An additional uh, very important um, fact to keep in mind when making business-related decisions in this sense is the fact that uh, uh, investor sentiment is very much affected by where we are seeing uh, policy incentives and where we are seeing regulation. And regulation is not only, of course, from the compulsory type, but also uh, regulation that we see in terms of uh, funneling uh, uh, investment and, and uh, uh, just government funds into specific directions, like what we're seeing with the uh, IRA in the United States uh, in, over the course of the past year. Finally, the uh, point that I would like to make before I dive into the actual uh, uh, practical advice that I want to give in this respect is the fact that we all need to look very strongly into the future of markets as it uh, uh, coincides with Article 6. Article 6 is something that many of you have uh, heard me uh, talk about. And um, um, it is essentially an international uh, trading uh, system that is going to become operational uh, over the course of 2025. That is something that I've been actually uh, been advising the uh, UNF Triple uh, C Secretariat on. I'm uh, uh, advising the uh, Legal Affairs Division on the actual drafting of this uh, mechanism. And it is really uh, coming into play very, very quickly. And we are starting to see the specifics of the rules and what form this uh, uh, mechanism is going to take. And ultimately what it is going to do is uh, create convergence. It will create, uh, here uh, by the way, we, we can see a model of the global economic benefits of Article 6, which are really uh, uh, extensive and, and there's actually no question on, on how this is going to uh, enhance the activity in the market. Um, so, so back to the point on convergence and uh, what we're actually seeing here is the fact that um, Article 6 is be going to become quite dominant, but it will not eliminate other uh, um, mechanisms that exist in the carbon markets world. And uh, Michael will talk about uh, the BCM and, and some of the elements of compliance programs uh, uh, in a minute, but it, it's really important to stress the fact that none of these are going away. They will not uh, uh, evaporate into thin air. Everything is going to stay in the place. In place, however, their size will definitely change, and there will definitely be a convergence into the standard set by Article uh, Six. To that, there will uh, probably be no question. So how do we tie all of this together? What, what does it essentially mean for us uh, when we're looking at how to leverage the markets to uh, increase uh, investment into climate technologies? So again, um, the, the main message that we are coming back to is the fact that uh, carbon markets are not the objective. They're merely a tool. They're a means to an end 
because we need to attain uh, a climate objective. The market in itself is not the goal. Uh, however, the, we, we do have a central tool here, and this is the pragmatism of uh, um, financial sector, of investors, and, and so on. And ultimately, like uh, uh, John Kerry is uh, saying here, um, is the deal bankable? Is the deal bankable? And in order to be able to answer that question for your buyer or for your investor, um, you would need to look at, um, I guess, two primary sets of issues for yourself as well, of course. And uh, I've tried to set them out here and I'll, I'll talk about them really briefly. First of all, um, what we try to do when we work with companies in this arena is to, first of all, um, try to enter the state of mind of the buyer. And that is important for the investor as well, because ultimately the investor is going to be looking at the interest of the end buyer of those credits that are going to uh, uh, be, be developed through uh, the specific technology that the investor is uh, considering investing in. So we're looking at whether we can uh, um, design and specify a narrative by which it is very clear that the new technology is contributing to decarbonizing the value chain for that uh, specific customer or allowing them to improve their own uh, uh, internal decarbonization plan. For example, uh, uh, through a program for bond issuance that, that would have to lean on those types of projects. That's one. Second, are we solving a specific regulatory pain um, for, for that end customer? And that can really manifest itself in uh, a number of ways, including uh, reduction in uh, carbon taxation, including uh, elements that can assist in attaining um, uh, caps under the um, EU ETS, um, issues that are related to uh, decreasing prices uh, that, that are uh, coming in through the carbon border adjustment mechanism, and of course, alignment with taxonomy. So those are just a few examples, but uh, uh, once a um, technology that is being considered for investment can clearly give a response to these questions. Are we solving this specific type of pain or are we giving a response to the value chain and so on? That can become a real game changer. There, there is where the uh, value enhancement lies. Um, of course, then there would come the issue of how we can prove the quality and integrity of the specific uh, uh, credits. And that's like a, an entire uh, universe of its own that I will not go into right now, but you can see the uh, some of the main issues listed here. Um, the second, uh, I guess, content matter, the uh, topic that I wanted to discuss is identifying obstacles and risks for the uh, climate tech uh, company itself. So there are, um, two major clusters of, of issues that need to be taken into account. First of all, the actual engagement with the investor. There are uh, several pitfalls and, and risks that are inherent within these transactions that need to be really uh, uh, addressed in depth when engaging in these contracts. And I've listed some examples here. There's really like a, a partial list. Um, there are uh, many issues that need to be taken into account that can really um, affect the ability of the company to function over time to be able to deliver the credits that it has uh, um, committed to delivering uh, its ability to engage with other buyers um, with respect to that same technology, um, the, the fungibility of the credits. And, and so there are many, many issues that need to be taken into account that uh, the young companies really need to be cognizant of before they sort of, uh, so to speak, sell their future. 
Um, the, the second uh, content matter world relates to the project development itself in order to commercialize the credits. And uh, there we have many issues relating to uh, legal aspects like ownership of rights and ownership of data, uh, uh, additionality, uh, jurisdictional risk, which is becoming more and more prevalent uh, because of Article 6 and so on. So those are the main issues that need to be addressed. And, and um, in my final uh, slide, I what I've done is I've listed uh, really the types of innovative tools that are coming into play um, um, with respect to financing and investing in uh, innovative technologies. And this is actually a list of things that we are working on now with uh, some of our clients. Uh, one of the most prevalent tools is the offtake uh, agreements and uh, what is called uh, pool financing for, for future generated credits. Uh, we have some interesting uh, projects relating to insetting and uh, to actual investment by uh, a company that has an internal uh, pricing scheme. And uh, finally, there is a very interesting uh, trend of VC funds that are actually specializing in, in uh, carbon markets and in a concept called carbon shares, where you can actually purchase a portfolio in divided in between uh, uh, credits and categories of, uh, of credits. So there's um, a lot of activity going on in this space and a lot of innovative tools that can be really tailored to the specific situation and circumstances of each of the uh, companies. Um, and, and it is really important to become uh, acquainted and learn how to speak the language of the market, so to speak, uh, in order to uh, make sure that uh, there is maximum value enhancement in, in these activities. Um, the final issue that we're working on right now that could be interesting to some of you is um, work that we are doing in terms of uh, really diving into specific sectors. We have work being done in the banking sector for for them specifically as actors within uh, market. And we have specific work being done on mobility and transportation, on uh, alternative proteins and on uh, the building and, and construction sector. So uh, if there is anyone specifically interested in those and please uh, uh, let us know and, and we can uh, have a conversation around that. And uh, thanks. Uh, uh, for your attention. Uh, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, at the end. And uh, Michael, I'm going to hand it over to you, please. Thank you. My screen. Does that work? Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, very nice presentation. Great lead-in to, to mine. Uh, I have to say, I've never been so honored to be on a webinar or a talk before, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't have words to describe uh, October 7th, but uh, I can say that you have all our support here at Clear Blue and, and, and also the support here in Canada from all the communities. So, uh, and saying that, I look forward to being in Israel again very soon. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on uh, carbon markets and carbon pricing. I think there's a lot of great things and so much that you said in the in the talk before, your talk, Ruth, that, that touches on this. Uh, so I'm going to really keep, try to do my best to keep it to pricing, but I fully agree with all the things you, you, you mentioned there, including the opportunity and the need for innovative cl uh, climate technology. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in the perspective of both the compliance markets and the voluntary markets. I think there's a lot of uh, many opportunities there, but also some misunderstanding of what those two different markets are and actually how they're converging as well at the same time. Very quickly, uh, just to talk about Clear Blue and is more about our perspective. Uh, myself and the co-founders of Clear Blue, we've been doing carbon markets for almost 20 years now. It's been a very interesting uh, 20 years. 
uh, through the compliance markets in the EU, through the CDM, which I know many of you in, in Israel have, have experienced. I see some old friends here on, on the webinar that I've done CDM projects with in, in Israel before. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the old carbon market of, of EU ETS CDM is, is somehow coming back through the voluntary carbon market of uh, offset project development and all the challenges and all the exciting opportunities that are available there. And, and looking at this, uh, it's a great uh, map that we get every year from the World Bank. Uh, and what I can say here is that every year the, the map gets more colorful. And, and what this represents uh, are all the different carbon markets that are, are growing uh, into the different jurisdictions. Uh, and that's a key driver in, in, in all of this. Uh, the voluntary market is great. Uh, and it's very important. Uh, but what the voluntary market is important for is, is essentially where uh, there isn't a carbon price. Uh, and the aim is to have carbon pricing uh, as many places and many industrial uh, and many sectors as possible to put that carbon price uh, on there to drive emissions down. Uh, today is around 25% of the emissions on, in globally are under a pricing scheme. And that continues to increase. Uh, and we'll talk about a few of the key ones, such as the EU and then what we have in California. But something to keep in mind is uh, an, an offset project, when we talk about offset projects, uh, that essentially only occurs when there isn't a carbon price on the activity. If there's a carbon price on the activity, your incentive to reduce is the carbon price itself. So uh, what might be an offset project in one jurisdiction may not be an offset project in another jurisdiction because of the fact of that carbon pricing uh, uh, facing the, the, the activity. We look at uh, the value of these carbon markets. It's also quite interesting to see this uh, from the perspective of, of where the value, at least on the traded side is. It is in the compliance markets. Uh, it, they're massively, we're talking about trillions of dollars. If you look at the chart here, uh, the voluntary is the dark blue, the navy blue in the, in the very top. It's a very small piece compared to the major uh, uh, compliance markets, but saying that it continues to grow as they all continue to grow. Uh, and part of the challenge is, uh, how the transition between voluntary markets and compliant markets will, will occur going forward. But the key point here is uh, carbon pricing is here. Uh, it's getting higher and higher and more and more valuable. Uh, and the opportunities to uh, deploy technologies uh, that reduce uh, emissions is going to be greater and greater as the value of that carbon price goes up. Uh, as you can see in the compliance markets, uh, uh, it, it's also, I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding as well that there's a, a significant need for emission uh, reduction technologies in the compliance markets, not just on offset projects and, and seeing where technology can be de deployed in those places. And many times it can be even more interesting because of a, a clear price uh, in those compliance markets. Uh, and again, uh, there's a lot of challenges. We, you know, we've been working in these markets for, for, for a long time now, and we see how difficult it is for many of these compliance entities to reduce their emissions. And many of them are looking for those break breakthrough technologies to actually uh, get away from the emissions and get away from the carbon price. Uh, when we come to the, the voluntary market, it's been a very exciting time in the last three, four years uh, as the voluntary market has rejuvenated itself. And, and many companies have, have now looked to uh, make these reductions and, and, and actually commit to, to reduction through offsets. Uh, and that's now... As, we, as it matures, becoming in many ways more regulated. Some people are even calling the voluntary market a, a quasi-compliance market in itself. I won't spend too much time on this slide. Uh, I think part of the reason we show this slide is to show that uh, there are two different markets essentially between the, the compliance and the voluntary, but it can be complex. Uh, and and it's, it's something that why you need uh, uh, groups like Herzog and Ruth to help you navigate the, the different complexities of the markets and, and understand where is the best opportunity for potentially your technology or where's the best opportunity for you to invest. Uh, and there's then the overlap between the two. Uh, and something to keep in mind is that many of these corporates or multinationals that are facing compliance markets are also now facing voluntary markets and vice versa. So there's an overlap. Uh, and in many ways, it, when there is this overlap, uh, you're paying twice for a certain emission, which actually at the same time makes the technology uh, deployment even more valuable. Uh, just because you're complying in a carbon market doesn't mean you've met your, your net zero targets. Uh, at the same time, uh, here, of course, the aim is to continue to reduce your emissions. Something that we focus on here at ClearBlue is really bringing transparency to the market. Uh, and that comes up often because uh, there is no single price of carbon. It's not like other commodities where, you know, the price of gold or the price of oil, uh, it can be very uh, 
confusing and very challenging, especially for multinationals that have uh, sites across the different jurisdictions which face a carbon price uh, that is different. So uh, what we try to bring to the to the market is that understanding of you know what is the carbon price and what is the carbon price that you face. At the same time, you look at it the other way uh, when you're de you know deploying technologies and, and, and looking to reduce emissions. Uh, it's very important when you're trying to value your project or value your technology. Uh, of where you know all else equal, what's the carbon price that your reduction is going to achieve? Uh, and looking at that and, and, and considering you know where do you want to start to deploy your technology if if there's that opportunity for you, uh, and looking at the carbon price and and then even further down. How does the regulation uh, acknowledge your technology? Does it acknowledge it? And that's a challenge these days, uh, especially in the compliance markets, is not all the regulations properly uh, value certain technologies uh, just because of the way it's, they're, they're derived. So it is very important to understand uh, the markets that you're in or looking to go in uh, to get the most value and to make sure you achieve that value. Uh, it's a critical part of that. And we see that often uh, a lot of the technology developers or technology uh, creators come to us trying to understand the regulations and trying to understand where should they just start to deploy their technology. And this is just carbon pricing. You have, especially in North America and also in the EU, you have other standards such as low carbon fuel standards that actually overlap and you can start to tier your technology and get extra uh, benefits across the different environmental attributes. So definitely very important to understand uh, what is the full potential value of your technology uh, or what's the full opportunity for reducing? Just to talk about a few of the markets uh, and the history of, of carbon pricing, uh, the EU ETS, I'm sure most of you are aware of, is really the foundational carbon pricing program. Uh, I would say today it's the program that most, if not all new programs uh, compare themselves to and look for guidance. Uh, it has been an interesting ride uh, since 2008. Uh, this is a, probably my favorite chart in carbon pricing, just trying to tell the story of the ups and downs of pricing in, in the EUTS. Uh, and when you look at this, of course, uh, what happened in 2021, just around COVID time, the, for a number of factors, one, the EU started to change the regulation to make it more tighter, but two, the world changed uh, and, 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 you know, reducing emissions and, and and going towards net zero became quite important. Uh, and we saw this significant increase uh, uh, to where we are today. I think today we're around 70, 80 years, but we hit a high of, uh, of 100 euros. We broke 100 euros in February 2023. And this high pricing stimulates uh, innovation and stimulates new technology to be, to, to be deployed as emitters in Europe. And there's about 12,000 installations in Europe. Plus now we have shipping entering it. We have the airlines in there. So it's, it's even greater than that from a, a non-facility perspective. They're facing this high price and they're looking for ways to make reductions. They're looking for those technologies to help them achieve lower costs when it comes to carbon, which is the whole point of carbon pricing is to drive those emissions down. So one thing I should mention, uh, part of this increase that we see here, and we'll, when we go to the WCI, the California market, not only was this driven by the market going shorter and, 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 and emitters looking to, to secure allowances, financials played a significant role. So a significant amount of financials uh, moved into the EUTS as, as traders, which is allowed. Uh, and they really drove up prices. Uh, they took long-term views on the EUTS. They still remain there. It's something we collect. We have uh, all the trading data and, and the position data of all these traders and, and financials that are moving in. Uh, and they're really helping drive this uh, value creation in, in the EUTS. And we see the same thing here in California. Uh, it's the major market in North America. It's actually linked to Quebec here in Canada. Uh, and we see around the same time, uh, this market, it has a floor price, this red line. And you can see historically the, the price traded at the floor. So basically traded at the minimum price, uh, at least at the auctions. It, it can, in theory, can go down below the price, but essentially the, the red line kept the floor. Uh, and after what happened similar time in COVID, uh, for similar reasons, and, and a big reason, even additional to that was after many of the traders came in and, and took their opportunity uh, in the EUTS, they said to themselves, where's the next big market that we could enter? And California was that market. And you can see the price take off. Uh, and now we're trading at all-time highs in, in, in California. 
uh, even under the economic conditions, uh, as there's a strong belief in these markets and a lot of uh, financial players entering this market and and taking positions around that. So it's quite interesting it's interesting to see this. I think we're at a unique pay, uh, time in carbon markets where uh, we've never seen so many investors taking positions in these markets. Uh, I think we're going to share these slides, so I won't go into the details in all these, but uh, from an investor perspective, um, you can see here that uh, it's a unique opportunity. There's not a direct correlation between other markets. So I think a lot of uh, the financials look for opportunities with that. Uh, there's different ways of investing in these markets from taking ETFs to, to taking long positions, short positions, uh, and then actually entering into, as Ruth mentioned, looking into investing into projects themselves uh, on the offset side of things, uh, and actually uh, funding technologies and, and, and supporting emission uh, emitters to, to make those reductions. If we start looking at the general bigger picture here, uh, and that's the going to, 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 to net zero, what we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, and there's a reason why this tails off because many of the emitters have decided to, to, to or years ago to make commitments. We saw these, these major corporates make commitments to uh, go to net zero, uh, uh, do all they can do to make reductions uh, on site. But of course uh, it's, uh, it, very difficult to reduce anytime soon, uh, and, and we like to share this because you know we often hear uh, criticism of the voluntary carbon market and say, "Well, just stop your emissions." And and we know for a fact that even when you face a carbon price like in the EVTS of 100 euros, you are still emitting as an emitter because it's not it's it's next to impossible to shut down your emissions, especially quickly. Uh, and uh, to expect corporates to come there and and to just reduce their emissions uh, overnight is 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 not possible. So one solution to that, and, and uh, one one possible tool for that, I should not use the word solution, looking at my slide, are offsets. Uh, and the way we see it and the way it is, is uh, if we cannot re make our reductions uh, on site, we can support reductions that otherwise would not occur. And that's an offset. And, and Ruth touched on the concept of additionality. Uh, it, it has to be really stressed that uh, offsets are only those uh, emission reductions that wouldn't have occurred without the investment, without the carbon price. Uh, and it can occur again where there's no carbon price. And something to keep in mind, uh, you know, the Western world created this climate change issue. Uh, it is what it is. I don't think we can expect developing countries uh, to not uh, be able to grow like the West did. Uh, at the same time, we can't cannot impose a carbon price today. They have to have this opportunity to grow. So uh, rather than let them grow and make the same mistakes that we've done, we're providing an incentive through these things called offsets to say, hey, don't do it this way, do it the better way. And here's some support with that through financing, through things like such as offsets. But there's no, there's you know, no good corporate citizens going to uh say we're going to use offsets and continue to use offsets uh, for forever. Uh, no CEO wants to keep on paying for these extra emissions. And as Ruth mentioned, uh, those that are buying offsets have more incentive to make their reductions internally than those that don't because it's an extra cost that they don't, they don't want to pay for. So the, it's actually the opposite. You know, It's not greenwashing. The fact that you are buying offsets will drive you to make reductions sooner as a corporate than later. You know, what is the voluntary carbon market? It, again, I'll say it's not greenwashing. Uh, there are buyers, there are sellers, and there are rule makers. They're sitting in the middle, we, groups like Vera and Gold Standards. Uh, again, it's not driven by uh, jurisdictions. It is driven by these independent bodies, such as Vera, which are non-for-profits. Uh, uh, they're there to help uh, run the system. It's not perfect. I don't think any program is perfect. Uh, it's getting better. I think there's been, and we'll touch on that after, a lot of criticism, unjustly, uh, unjustifiable of the markets uh, over the last couple of years. I think it's more important to build them up than, than break them down. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and I think, you know, building up the credibility, building up and assuring additionality will be key. Uh, and bringing uh, unique and interesting technologies to the forefront uh, is what the voluntary market will do. Just want to touch on this topic. I think you hear a lot about this, especially in the tech world these days. Uh, you talk, you hear about carbon removal. You hear about DAC, direct air carbon capture. All great things. Uh, DAC is great, but DAC isn't going to solve our problem anytime soon. If you look at the largest projects that are out there today, it's about six thousand tons a year. Um, when we're talking about millions of tons that need to be done, or billions. Uh, it's great research. It's great that Amazon, it's great that Microsoft and, and Shopify are making those investments. But the reality is we need to make the reductions today and avoidance projects, not emitting to begin with, such as we're talking about in places that are developing, uh, giving them the incentive to not emit in the first place 
is very important. So I just want to touch on that because I'm I'm sure many of you have heard about you know the credibility of offsets and and the confusion around avoidance. But uh, not emitting in the first place is always better than emitting and then capturing later on. And some of the criticism uh, I'm going to try to get through this quickly before I get my time up. But uh, a lot of uh, uh, well, a lot of clickbait to be honest. Uh, a lot of news out there but a few projects that are not perfect uh uh misunderstanding from journalists of what really are the problems uh it sounds exciting to talk about that but being in this market for so long uh i think most projects are good uh most projects are doing well uh it's also very important to have co-benefits and talk about all the other things that are important such as job creation and clean water etc but a lot of the projects have lost sight on what's important here, and it's a ton of CO2. Uh, that's what the, cli the climate change problem is about, tons of CO2. So all these other projects that are talking about other co-benefits, they're great, but we must focus on the problem uh, and making reductions. And that's why uh, we at Clear Blue believe it's important to work with the large emitters. It's important to work with oil and gas. It's important to work with those that have the problem because that's where the opportunity is. It's great to have forest projects. It's great to have these as well. Um, but th there is there needs to be a, a renewed focus on, uh, on tons of CO2. And I think there needs to be a, an understanding that none of this is perfect. It will continue to develop and will continue to get better uh, as we go forward. But to expect offset projects to be perfect from day one, and and, the, and when we find those that are not, to then say all of it is a scam or a fraud is it's just unfair and it's not productive. And and we've seen this in the last year or so, where all this news and all this uh, noise has put a slowdown on buyers because they're scared to get you know like Delta Airlines, they're scared to get fined, and it makes no sense that Delta, because of the words they use, were were buying you know millions of offsets, gets called out uh, versus the airlines that do nothing. Uh, and that's a shame in, in the big picture. If you look at pricing, uh, this was reflected of that. We've seen the pricing uh, take a hit over the last uh, few months from the, the highs that we were seeing in January 2023. Uh, it's stabilizing now. Uh, we do expect pricing to go up. Uh, and uh, I'll show some forecasts that we have. But again, this is, touches on the fact that uh, the negativity in the press uh, has it hindered the market. Uh, one challenge in the voluntary market is uh, there are so many offsets out there uh, and we've categorized them into different groups, but uh, there's no single price, especially for offsets because of the uniqueness of every project, but the market prices that in. And this is information that we collect, uh, understanding you know, what's the value of an offset project of that particular type. Uh, we have tools to do that. And I think that's quite important for those that are looking for the value of their offset potential project or continue, you know, if they have one today, what's the value of that offset? So we have all the data, uh, happy to share and, and, and show historical data. Uh, and we also have forecasts as well that I can show you after. Very quickly, uh, I want to say that uh, going back to the criticism of the voluntary uh, and the offset market, it's not easy to develop an offset project. It takes a long time. I would say uh, over the 20 years I've been doing projects, maybe 5% of the projects that have been presented to me as offset projects actually ever issued an offset because of the challenges and, and the lengthy approval process. But that's a good thing because when you ha do have an offset, an offset project, that has value and, and, and it's, it's, it's good quality. So um Offsets are not handed out like candy. It's not easy. Uh, uh, it takes time. And it's very important to, to be uh, diligent in the process. And it's also very important to make sure you create the value and, and know where to, to develop your projects and know how to manage your project. I think implementation is a key part. It's great to have a good project, but managing that project and then commercializing and having a strategy of how you want to get the value out of your project, how you want to sell your offsets, uh, long-term, short-term, spot, uh, combination. Uh, these are all critical parts of the long-term success of your project. Uh, very quickly, on, on going back to the VCM and where it's going, our analysis shows that uh, there will be, be continuous increase of demand uh, by corporates, especially as we clarify, you know, get rid of some of this noise that we had over the last year. Uh, and this will be going towards 2050 as the net zero targets are, are set for 2050 for the most part. Uh, we see the demand continue to go up. Uh, there will be, of course, increased uh, compliance markets that will overlap with this, but we do expect demand to outstrip supply over the next few years uh, and focusing on tons of CO2 uh, and maybe less so on all the other co-benefits as uh, corporates realize that the important thing in all this is the ton of CO2. 
and I will end uh, on this slide uh, is our price forecast. I think this is a key part of 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 long term viability of projects. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that our price forecast will be for sure this way, but I think that what's more important here uh, is the direction uh, and everything that we see from the demand, uh, including also the supply, uh, and also as corporates coming in just talking to us that there is this uh, need for offsets. And we do expect the prices to continue to go up uh, after the, over the next few years and significantly uh, as it gets harder and harder as well uh, to, to make reductions. And I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That has really brought uh, a, a level of depth that was much needed uh, for the ecosystem. And um, I look forward to our collaboration. We're beginning uh, work on some uh, projects together right now. So, so I'm really excited about that. And thank you again. Um, I'd like to introduce Danny, Danny Hadar. Um, I will I'll just one moment, share my screen. Okay. Um, Danny, I have to say before Danny begins that uh, for me, it, it, it wasn't simple to get him to uh, come on board because this is like not something that he does on a regular basis. And so, so I'm uh, twice as thrilled if, uh, that he agreed to, to join us today. And uh, I first got to know uh, Danny actually around climate talks and carbon markets and, and so on, I think a little over a year ago. And I was really fascinated to understand his way of thinking about it because he doesn't naturally come from this field and, and uh, you know, not really intrinsically uh, uh, invested completely in it. He actually has other uh, uh, areas of interest in his uh, daily activities. And, and that's why I thought it would be very uh, enlightening for all of us to hear his thoughts and how he comes into this arena and what, what his considerations uh, are around this. So uh, Danny, thank you so much for joining and please go ahead. Thank you, Hoot. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I usually don't like to do so much uh, talks like that, but since uh, uh, Greta was uh, so disappointing just lately, so I decided to do it. Uh, so uh, I don't have a presentation. Uh, just uh, gonna do it as a free talk, I'll tell you a bit about like my, my journey here in climate, and then um, and then happy to answer any questions. Uh, so basically, I'm Dani Adar. I founded Jibe Ventures with my partner Asaf uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, so we invest in Israeli entrepreneurs at seed and pre-seed stage, and we do it in few sectors. So we do, like everyone else, enterprise software and fintech and cybersecurity. But uh, since I had some background of few years of investment in, in healthcare, then we do healthcare. And about four or five years ago, uh, I started to to get more excited about the climate and the potential of investing in technologies in climate. Uh, so I would I would say that we are not a climate focused fund, but it's definitely something we put a lot of effort into. So until now we did about um, uh, six investments in the climate space. Uh, I can elaborate uh, about them, uh, maybe about each one of them a, a bit later. And uh, and in terms of like uh, investment thesis of someone that, that didn't necessarily came from a uh, climate for, for, for 20 years, uh, I would say that, um, so as seed investor, eventually we are obviously, we really try to focus on the founding teams that uh, we believe has a strong uh, background, not necessarily in climate, but strong background uh, and, and capabilities and skills uh, to solve a specific problem that basically they, self, they set themselves to solve. So we're not necessarily focused on like a specific space like agriculture or energy, uh, but rather on anything that is a tough problem, technical technical problem, uh, with a great team that we can rely on. And, uh, and when we believe the market in, is large enough and it can be scaled to something meaningful. Uh, so not a niche project, uh, which basically it's almost anything in climate nowadays. Uh, now a lot of those uh, problems that they try to solve uh, needs to rely on uh, carbon markets as a business model, uh, which uh, I have to admit, I mean, we are not very excited about that, that part. 
that they that some of them really need to rely uh, solely on cover markets. So we it's not it doesn't mean necessarily we're gonna like not do the investment, but it means that we really want to try and find out if there is like other ways uh, to for more business models in addition to the carbon markets. Um, although we truly believe this market is happening, but we don't know the pace of the market of this market as, as how fast it's going to happen, if it's going to happen the fast as uh, as people uh, predict or not. So so this is where we are a bit more cautious. So until now, we really did only one out of those six that. Uh, is almost purely relying on those markets, uh, like the risks, like like we as as a as a fund that we probably not gonna take. So if it's gonna be like a crazy capex intensive and like five ten years to develop, then we're probably not the best investors because we're not big enough. It's gonna uh, needs a lot of uh, capital. Uh, if the moat itself is not uh, in the technology, but rather just the business model innovation or or a software for carbon accounting or anything like that, then we also feel we don't have an edge. Um, and then uh, I would say that what's really like uh, make it attractive. Is so so the most attractive is really to have like a very strong team that is very multidisciplinary, that's going through, basically going on a tough problem uh, with a very large potential market. Uh, and and hopefully it's not 100% dependent on local regulations or on, uh, on the carbon markets. So. Uh, this is where we see most of our investments in. Um, I can give, uh, I think the best way to do this is to, like to maybe to give you um, examples of investments that we did. And then in the Q&A session, we can go deeper on things that you you are more interested in to learn from the perspective of a seed investor. So so I would say, so the first investment we did was in uh, tomorrow, tomorrow IO. Uh, it's more on the adaptation part not necessarily on mitigation. Uh, like their mission is really to help, uh, you know, countries and businesses uh, to better manage their weather related challenges. So, and they supply information and insights and everything to manage those. So in, do they use like proprietary data, they use uh, satellites now, it became like a space company in the last couple of years. It wasn't like that when we invested, uh, basically to give the most accurate and most real time insights and, and warnings on weather related disasters. So. Uh, Ruth, I think, I think showed that every 18 days you have those those uh, disasters nowadays. So they can give a lot of uh, warnings about those as well as any any weather related. And then um, another investment that we did is in the carbon capture space, which is a uh, carbon blue. Uh, um, it's on the mitigation part. So they they basically a solution to remove the the excess uh, carbon, the excess CO2 from uh, seawater, and they lock it away. So by by doing that, uh, they both counter like the ocean acidification and also the environmental impacts, and they can capture the carbon. Now this is an example of a company that uh, when we invested, we were thinking about what other business model other than carbon markets can be here. We had few ideas, but eventually we pulled the trigger when it was only carbon markets. Uh, now we know that there are few things that might be very interesting as like backup business models, like for example. Uh, Reducing like OPEX uh, for desalination plants, uh, etc. Uh, so we did like a pre-seed investment. The, the technology is really proving itself uh, so much that the Frontier uh, chose them and bought uh, future car carbon credits from them, which is a very big sign of uh, of uh, the potential of the technology. Uh, a third company we did is uh, actually in the supply chain. It's uh, Ansa. So they developed like a micro roasting machine uh, for coffee. So it uses like a, me a method based on like the dialectic heating uh, to activate the beans and applying energy to roast the fraction from core to shell of all of them. And the roasting process is governed by AI and fully autonomous system. And then it produced like a homogeneous and consistent roast. So if you think about it, like about 70% of all the cost and the emissions that relates to supply chains of something so big as coffee market can be reduced. So you can actually reduce like 70% of that, which is very, very meaningful. And then the business model is more SaaS, you know, that the companies that can have those micro roasters can uh, basically sign up as a SaaS model to the to get those raw beans and uh, roast them at the, at the edge instead of throughout this whole logistics. And, um, uh, and then we also, the fourth one was uh, we invested in Marvin. Uh, so Root uh, know them uh, pretty well because they are customers of HFN. 
so so basically they Marvin is more in the MRV space so they use like uh, geospatial data property AI you know and and other climate expertise uh, to launch like a platform really to build resilience regard to water resource management and also some, some carbon balance management but uh, to start with is water resource management they already signed a pretty large uh, design partners uh, in Latin America and it seems like it's a very good way to enter the market uh, through that so it's only in, it's only software in this case although we really believe that uh, we also need to invest obviously in hardware it's a hardware problem uh, atoms eventually so it's uh, but this one is uh, p is pure software it's very early it's, but it's showing a very interesting signs um, another one we invested the uh, Many of you probably know from the from what's happening right now in um, uh, like in Gaza. So it's a Xodigo. We did like a precede in this company that is uh, they provide like underground mapping for utilities and contractors and terrorist tunnels or whatever. Uh, but eventually, uh, exploration uh, you know exploration that exploits and depletes the earth is a zero sum game. So so they're accelerating the delivery and shortening the project lifespans you know to protect the environment also from unnecessary damage. So you you need less excavations, uh, less damage to the environment, less emissions. Uh, so it's a basically lighter touch uh, on the planet. And the last one is in agriculture. So you see everyone is very, very different. All of them is great teams that we really liked and business models that we can really rely on. Uh, the last one is fielding in agriculture. So uh, basically they partner with like high value crop growers, like almonds, fields and such and they digitize the operations and build um, an autonomous farm of the future. And they, by that, by doing that, they bring in a lot of efficiencies to uh, this is a very polluting uh, industry. Uh, they're already in a later stage. Uh, so they, they disclosed like a B round uh, recently and uh, they're doing very well right now, mainly in the US. Um, so I'll stop here. Uh, I think what I really wanted to, to, to emphasize is the examples of what we do and what how we think about the carbon markets, whether we can rely on upon or not. And they're happy to for the, the next 50 minutes. So for all of us also to answer a specific question that you may have. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, it was really interesting listening to you and, and uh, looking at um, the market and, and just the climate tech space from your perspective and just the diversification of uh, uh, your portfolio, which is really amazing, I think. And uh, I'm also glad to hear that uh, it, it can happen that uh, my investment advice actually works. Maybe I should, you know, change size and, and, and move to your arena. Maybe okay. I have a future there. Um, Okay, so we do have a few questions that I'll, I'll try to moderate. And Michael, um, some of them are uh, directed to you uh, and, and some to Danny. So um, Danny, in terms of, uh, you know, just uh, building on, on what we heard from you right now, um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more specifically on the technologies that are interesting to you right now or specific sectors that you are looking at and and see as those with the potential in the long term that uh, some some things that perhaps you uh, decided to make investments in um, over the course of the past few years but you have shifted from and and now uh, other areas that you would be more interested in so um, we are not so much uh, like theme driven. We're not so much uh, top down investors uh, in the way that uh, we operate in Jive uh, because we, we are a more generalist fund. So we invest in few sectors and not necessarily just in, uh, in climate. So we really focus on bottom up. So we focus on, on really listening to ideas that that founding team has then we go and research those ideas in, internally to see if it's, if the idea and the technology first has good modes and second can be really scalable to something big. So if it's if it's a carbon capture, for example, uh, uh, idea, and if, if it cannot eventually like reduce 100 megatons a year, then it's not interesting like for us if it's too small, too niche. Um, so I would say 
really, like you said, we continue to be that way. We continue to really focus from bottom up. Like if the founding team is very, very strong in the way we believe it should be very, very strong. And the, and, and the market that they go after uh, is, is big enough, then usually we do the investment regardless of which areas in climate it's going to be. That's on our side. So as an example, one of the investments that we did that I didn't mention here, it's very new, was like really three months ago. It's we invested in a team in ideation in climate. So really like we believe in, really believe in this team. And now we are kind of exploring different areas uh, for them to build upon. And we are just uh, ruling out a lot of ideas. This is too small. This is not hard enough. You know, this is a lot of competition. And until we find something that we think we should work on and can be really impactful eventually. So I don't want to say I'm just going to go energy. I'm going to go mobility. I'm going to go agriculture. I don't care. I mean, as long as it's impactful and, and, and hard and this team can actually do it and be really the best in it. So that's how we see that. As a seed investor, if I was like an A round later stage investor, I might have more more of a theme that I want to go to go for, but not not in our case. Thank you, Danny. So you mentioned scalability, and and that of course is like uh, you know we're in a situation where our challenge is basically what we're facing is trying, uh, uh, I guess, to. Um, just uh, uh, nitpick and at, at very small solutions and 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 try to collate them together. But ultimately, if we don't have game changing uh, technologies, then we're not really going to be able to move the needle. And and here uh, I want to address uh, this question to Michael regarding scalability and sort of the the other side of uh, this dilemma is. Where does it become uh, financially worthwhile to go through the excruciating process of commercializing credits and, and being a player within the markets? Uh, uh, where is the scalability in that? And, and when, when does it become worthwhile time-wise and, and investment-wise? And um, what is connected to that another uh, question that had arisen is why is it so uh, complex and, and time consuming to uh, come to this ultimate result of issuance of credits, the registries and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Uh, probably the, the the first answer is just the volume of credits that you could potentially get per year. That, that's, that's the simple, when we look at a project, what would be the annual offset production you could achieve uh, with your project. Uh, again, it's a different view if you're looking at a single project versus someone has technology. Of course, technology is a different discussion because then you could replicate that many times and, and that's important. But we look at, and it's just a mathematical discussion. You know, If it's 50,000 tons a year times what price you think you can get, and you work out the numbers based on what it would cost you to go through that that, that process. Keep in mind that that carbon process is normally more rigorous at the start, getting all the approvals, getting all the, and, and then the question is if there's a methodology already that exists or not. So this is what we need to look at. Uh, if you can slide yourself into those programs easily, or you have to restart the whole process. So that discussion really becomes a numbers game of how big your project potential is versus the cost along that process. But you know, I, I should be clear. I think that that the, the challenge and why that it takes so long, I don't want to say that's a. am happy about that, but in many ways is a good thing. Uh, if it was too easy, uh, there would be questions about the credibility of these offsets. And, and none of these groups that want to issue an offset and say, here's a good credit, want to be called out and said, and this is what's being hap is happening, is you, you, know, you gave this credit too easily. It wasn't really a real reduction. And, and that's the real challenge here is that balancing out between uh having speed but also having credibility the other challenge is uh and we saw this in the cdm world 15 years ago and we saw it again last year in the voluntary market these registries were overwhelmed they weren't expecting this interest to come at when it did so we had to give them time to scale up we talk about scalability they had to scale up the the, the system had to scale up and even the independent verifiers you know all the auditing firms they didn't have personnel ready to do that and we've seen that problem in the past as well and it happened again so it's really about uh, giving strength to the market and over time it will become more efficient. I think that the challenges I talk about now, but the length of time should only get better. It should only get better. 
Hey, thanks, Michael. Um, there are actually some more questions for Danny and another one uh, for Michael. So uh, uh, Danny, what you're being asked is uh, the name of the company that uh, you invested in the water resource, resource management. And then there's a question regarding the exit strategy for Carbon Blue. So for, I mean, the, the company in the, it's not water resource management so much. It's more like a water stress uh, uh, problems that might have, might be like a desert desertification and such. And it's a Marvin. So it's a Marvin Blue, um, which is one of their product lines uh, in that. It's also like a carbon product, a software company. So that's, that's one. As for Carbon Blue, so... I mean, there are a few, few, I mean, carbon blue eventually develops like a, it's like a duck, if you think about it, but it's from seawater. So, but think about it as the same exit strategy of duck companies. Eventually they build, uh, if uh, the, the more the technology is mature, they can build those facilities to uh, to capture the carbon. And as long, and, they have, and for now, they're going to be very reliant on carbon markets, but also potentially on the business model I mentioned before in the desalination plants. Uh, this it, it the, the the development of those facilities can can be internally or can be basically licensed outside. So it really depends where it's gonna go, and uh, and then eventually exit wise, it can either be selling standalone facilities. It can be it can really be sold on on a multiple of revenues. Uh, it can go IPO eventually if it's big enough. So uh, the way I see it is really like a a traditional startup. That the uh, that is just uh, hardware, not software. So it's very typical, very similar to other uh, hardware startups that develop facilities and, and factories. Uh, that's what I have to say about it. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so there's another question here regarding how to certify a new kind of uh, carbon credit and and where to start. Mm -hmm. um, so you. It, to the person asking, essentially, you have uh, these people here with you, and and there is, I should say, there is a uh, um, a specific, very uh, clear process that uh, one needs to go through in order to ultimately certify and and commercialize credits. Um, it it really the specifics depend on the type of technology or project and and uh, what sector it's in and uh, a lot of uh, legal and regulatory issues, a lot of financial issues. So uh, all those questions need to be analyzed and answered before you proceed. And also, of course, the question that Michael uh, addressed before regarding the uh, viability, the financial viability of the entire projects, because there is uh, 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 it's time consuming and it is costly. So it needs to be worthwhile, of course, in, in, in order to invest the effort that is involved. Uh, however, as I said, um, at the outset, there is a very, very specific and almost regulatory uh, process that needs to uh, uh, ensue in order to be able to uh, uh, end up at the point of uh, credit certification and, and issuance. And it, it's a, a clear process that, uh, you know, it varies from registry to registry on platform to platform, but the, the uh, essential elements are um, almost always the same. That's just, you know, uh, in general. And, and now, um, before we conclude, Michael, if you can address the question uh, to you, that related to uh, the increasing demand in uh, carbon offsetting, do you think the necessary technologies are already there to cope with the rising amounts of carbon to be offset? Uh, yeah, another great question. Uh, I would say no, uh, but that's another good thing. I think that's where this innovation and 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 groups like and people like Danny can invest in new technology to achieve this and and that's all part of the process that this is what carbon markets are here for to get these new breakthrough technologies that can uh deal with this issue of, of, of needing to offset all the emissions that are out there uh and that's where this process then can enter this new methodology creation so i think that's also part of the, the other question is you have to develop the methodology get it approved by these groups but that's part of day one since carbon markets is a bottom-up approach you you come with a new technology 
you get that understood, you get that approved by the regulatory bodies or the, the, the registries here, and you go forward. But that is what this is about. I think we're far from the technologies that we need to achieve the goals that we need to get to net zero. Uh, so lots of technologies to come. Thank you, Michael. And um, I think we're coming to the conclusion of this event. Um, it has been really a pleasure um, to host everyone and to partner with uh, uh, the Israeli Innovation Authority and with Planetech. I really, really wish it were under different circumstances. But I, uh, if I may be frank uh, and, and open, um, I feel like if we do need to uh, um, address the, these challenging times, then th there couldn't be a better community and a stronger community, and I feel honored to be part of it. So uh, thank you all again very much, and I really hope that we continue to meet in this format. Um, everyone is uh, more than welcome to send us emails with uh, additional questions and follow-up, and we will be, of course, distributing the um, uh, recording and the presentations. Thank you very so, much. Thank you and have thank a you. good rest of the week. Bye everyone.